Hi, I'm Eric Ostro. Live with the Lortel is about to start. For season two, while theaters are dark, we are discussing with our guests their thoughts on the reckoning the theater community is facing for systemic racism and their vision for the future of the American theater. To broaden our perspective, I am sharing my platform with co-hosts from the BIPOC community. We offer these conversations to help us learn and to start the healing process. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Live at the Lortel. My name is Eric Ostro. You are in for an incredible treat uh, this evening. Uh, we have a phenomenal guest, and I can't wait to talk to her. Let me first bring on my great friend and co-host for the evening, John Andrew. John Andrew. Well, hello, hello, Mr. Ostro. It's nice to see you as You always. as well. You look refreshed, good lighting. Well, thank you. And a new background. I got one yeah, of those I see that. I see that. <laughs> you look great. You know what? This is your friend. Why don't you just make a quick intro for our guest and let's bring her on and get started. Well, I've known Mary E. Hodges. Um, don't forget from the E. I, I said it, Mary oh, okay. just from back in the day, Manhattan Theater Source 100, you know, mm. back in 19. Um, but um, she was a part of the uh, Tony nominated slave play on Broadway. She's done TV, she's done theater, she's an educator, she's a mom, she's fabulous. Um, she's funny, she's delightful, she's gloriously wonderful, um, Mary E. Hodges. Yes. Oh, wow. Welcome, Mary E. <laughs> I was trying to remember, like when, like when were you working at Manhattan Theatre Source? Like back in the. Well, I don't know if. Okay, so I wasn't exactly working at Manhattan Theatre Force. <laughs> Theatre Source. I was like the girlfriend of <laughs> someone who was working oh, at Manhattan right. Theatre Source, and then. <laughs> By way of, then I got involved in that Manhattan Theater Source. A whole nother That's world. A good again. Yes. <laughs> Manhattan Theater Source. God, I, I we could talk I'm, about it, but Fiona right? and myself, and oh I my mean, gosh. I was involved in it a long time ago. Anyway, Mary E, thank you so much for doing this. I'm Did I really freeze, excited. Or is that you all freezing? You. Can you hear me? Can we you? can hear you. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. Can you hear uh -oh. us? Was that me? Or you uh, all? We can see you and hear oh, you. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We can yeah, yeah. hear you and see oh, you. Sorry. you look amazing. Yeah, no worries. Like so I'll uh. just pretend that it's normal. Oh no, you look great. I can hear <laughs> okay, you wonderfully. Great. First of all, let, let's start off. How how are you doing? Uh, we've been in uh, like this crazy place for the past year, but how are you and your yeah. son and your family? How are you um, doing? Thank you for asking. Um, I'm doing well. Um, like most theater artist, you know, we're wondering when we can be together. You know, that's the main ultimate question. And every time you are working as an artist on the digital platform, there's always a little something, something pops up that reminds you, well, you know what? That wouldn't have happened if we were together. I can think of an example. I don't want to put anybody on blast, but you know, I just directed something. And <laughs> And if if we were together, like wardrobe and costume would have caught something. I'm, that's all I'm gonna say. You know, uh, if we were together, it's those little things. Like you can't just reach through the camera and like, <laughs> I if I could and like go like this and fix yeah. something through the screen, right? Yes, but you have to. If anything, um, we have to become better articulators and communicators. Um, because it's easily to have misunderstandings um, in the digital space, easily. Yeah. Um, so, um, without jumping into the pot right away, but you asked me how I'm doing. <laughs> I'm, I'm good. I know, yeah. And um, I'm surprisingly, you know, I'm blessed. I've been busy more than I thought I would be um, during this time, and I've just been directing. I performed. I had a few. Uh, uh, pieces that I was acting in, huh? but um, I think a balance of, you know, both. Well, that's very lucky. I mean, how lucky you are that you were able to to work during the past year as a director and actor. And let's just jump right in. Um, 
This past week with Fordham University and their students, you directed a Pulitzer Prize winning play, um, Water by the Spoonful at Fordham University. I saw it this weekend. I thought uh, I'd only read the play. I'd never seen um, a performance of it. Uh, and um, I gotta tell you, I, I thought you did a phenomenal job, especially when it comes to the digital part of the show. Uh, my expectations are always very low when it comes to watching something online um, and a play, but I, I don't know what you did with it in terms of digital and, and how you played around with it. But I, I got to tell you, you, it was a very clear and concise piece of um, online theater. And I take my hat off to you. It was incredible. Thank you. And I hope you're not just being nice to me. No, I probably just <laughs> would have ignored okay. it and moved right on to something else. I, I don't, you know, I, well, you and I had a little discussion today on um, IG and, yes. and we're here to talk about truth. And yes. I, I, I think I would have skipped over it, but um, I would love for you to talk a little bit about your process of directing and um, how it came to you. And maybe if you want to touch a little bit on um, that great piece you worked on, Water by the Spoonful, that would be yeah. great. Um, thank you. Well, first, I have to give a shout out to Clint Ramos, who um, was part of the uh, the, the set uh, creator of um, Slave Play. Um, and he's head of design over at Fordham. Uh -huh. And he they were looking for guest directors for this season. And he referred me. And I must say, it was the first time that I didn't have to audition um, send in a portfolio, send in letters of recommendations, tap dance to get a job. Um, I was offered a, a guest directing spot uh, right there by the managing director. And um, she basically said to me, okay, there's four slots, which one do you want? <laughs> and then she said, well, what play do you want to direct? We have um, like five for you to choose from that we're looking at. And I got first dibs. And that has never wow. happened <laughs> to me. So I'm putting that out there that some people it happens to them on the regular. And, uh, and I'm not um, saying that to, to shame anyone, but I just, it's important. The point of doing this, I feel like you said, is like truth and what people have perceptions or what people don't know is that there's a whole group of us who we don't get asked or to do work. Hmm. Um, we, we're not um, called up and said, uh, you don't have to audition. You don't have to send anything in. We want you for the job. Right. Um, and so, and I'm X amount of years <laughs> and have been out here doing this for X, X, X amount of years. <laughs> and it finally happened. And I'm really appreciative and really grateful that um, I was seen and I was heard and and Clint knew um, and lifted me up by referral. So I'm saying also to say that we have to lift each other up. You know someone that can work and do the job, refer them. Yeah. You know, yeah. to say when, and when you do refer them, because we, you know, we have people that refer us for things that are just like crap. Don't refer us for things that you wouldn't do yourself. Okay. Don't, that's not, that's not being a friend. That's a very good point. I mean, there is Why? something re really nice about, yeah. Um, having, having that moment when like you get asked to do something or like, it's like, Oh wow. You know, that's a, that is a, uh, a nice career milestone to be able to go, wow, that happened and and own that and take that. Yeah. And um, I think the thing that I'm also curious about because you're a fantastic actor and like you work as an actor and as a director, how, how do they inform each other, right? Like, so what do you take from your, your acting work into the directing work and vice versa? Like being on the other side of the table informs how you, you, you play a role or da, 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 da. you know? So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious about how they feed one another, how they talk to one another for you as a, Yes. As, a, as a artist? That's a really good question. And thank you for asking it. Um, because often enough, people um, want you to choose, you know, or put one against the other versus framing it in the way that you framed it. So thank you. Um, 
for me, it's um, I like actors because I'm an actor hmm. and not that, oh, my acting sucks. So I'm going to be a director and then dump on actors um, and take out my and have my therapy with actors <laughs> as a director. Oof. OK, so <laughs> we've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and also I have to speak to my experience. I feel that I've had wonderful directors who were kind to actors, director friendly actors or teacher, right. director teachers. Right, right. Um, and that also informed me very early um, and has an influence on my approach and my style. So I'm not, People have enough going on in their lives. And actors, you know, I think get a bad rap when it comes to like being in the rehearsal hall in their personal lives. And we've been taught, if you've been in any training institution, that some some training institutions that, you know, you keep something separate, you know, you keep it outside the door, but you can't help but um, draw on that of, of who you are. Um, and so, I feel that I have an advantage in the room because I know actors mm -hmm. and I want to help them. I want to bring out their best and not highlight and sit, spend hours working on what they're not good at. Let's, let's, that'll come along. Um, I feel, um, and also being a director, I can choose actor friends that I know. <laughs> right. And that I like and work yeah, with, of course, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that trust you. And I've often when I was first starting out, I would call up on my actor friend, you know, that I was in shows with. I was like, I'm directing this thing. I was like, can you come do this for me? Mm -hmm. There's car fair. Remember car fair? Yeah. <laughs> that's what they're called car fair. And that's that's it. That's all they can give you. But, you know, sure, Mary. Sure. I'd love to do that with you. And that's helped me work on my craft of directing in those early years was calling on all my actor friends. And I keep calling on all my actor friends and I can't call John Andrew. He's like Obi out of my budget, but you know. <laughs> He's very, very uh, <laughs> busy these days. <laughs> no, but you know, someday, you know, it's, it's, that's, I hope I'm answering your question. I just feel that there's, um, I love it when I'm articulating something that we're working on and you see the actor like glean, you know, and, and, and smile and not feel at the end of the day beat up. Yeah. Um, and they come back excited to do more. I had um, a few actors on this last production because I was working with student actors. Right. And they said, yeah, I feel really excited. This is like the first time that I feel like I have a really good handle. Like we could put this up. We were on like week four and we worked on this for seven weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, we could put this up now without all the technology. And that was my goal is to, if, if we didn't have all of the OBS and the green screens, mm -hmm. we could still manually turn our cameras on and off, our mics on and off and still have a play. Well, so I'm, I'm wondering about the, from the directing to the acting, um, does that inform when you are working on a character or presenting something, is is there a little bit of director mind or director soul that's kind of going, oh, Mary? Or like, is that speaking to you when you're acting as well? Um, I think it's just so mixed up and merged. Um, mm -hmm. But I mm -hmm. think um, I probably always had that sense. Um, I've the, always had a strong sense as an actor of being grounded in who I am. It always starts with who you are. Yeah. I think. <laughs> and I've always had a, um, and I still do, a strong sense of who I am. Mm -hmm. So I think way, way, way before I knew it, you know, it wasn't a surprise to me that I'm directing. So put it that way. <laughs> yeah, got it. Have you always <laughs> had a, a strong sense of self? I mean, I, I can personally say that I really, I, I really, it's not recently, recently, but it's only been in the past maybe 10 years that I kind of gotten to know who I am a little bit more. And But have you always had a, a strong sense of self from a young age or? Yes. <laughs> yes. I come uh, from a very large family. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, you know, from that generation where you don't, 
show yourself, you don't shine. Mm -hmm. And there were, um, I have, you know, there were eight of us siblings wow. all together and my mom and dad. So we were like, we called ourselves the Black Brady Bunch, the Black Waltons, <laughs> like literally the Black Waltons because my dad like built a bench. We had benches on either side of the dinner table, true story. And my father sat at the head of the table and my mm. mom, and we grew up like that. Um, <laughs> so um, that gives you an identity. Now it's the Hodges family. We were called the Hodges family. And that was my identity for a long time. So even then though, I knew that I was an individual and Butcher told you're not supposed to shine. You're not mm. supposed to stand out. You're not supposed to express yourself really. And especially when you're part of like that pressure, the, the Hodges family, there's Nelson and Mary Hodges with the eight kids, <laughs> you know, and the white Volkswagon. <laughs> you know, that was like unique in itself. But when you're when you have all those siblings and we were we kind of split ourselves naturally in, in mm -hmm. groups. So there were the four older kids and the four younger kids. Yeah. And so I was like, I'm like number six. So you get lost in the mix, you know, yeah, in that identity. Um, but I knew under that, that I, you know, dying probably to express myself, but I was quiet and I watched and I observed. observed. I'm, I'm so curious then, like, the, you know, <laughs> the, 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 the 10 Hodges, how, how <laughs> did theater come to be? Why theater? How did that, how did that come to you? A miracle. <laughs> because and, it wasn't in our household. Yeah. We were like the cultureless family. And this is, you know, the, those, um, what do you talk about? Those things that, again, that uh, assumptions and perceptions, I think it's talked about in Outliers, right? What's the writer? Malcolm? Oh, the Gad guy that's Gadwell? writers in a lot yeah. of Yes. Yeah. That's, that's the one book. Did you all read that book? Yes. <laughs> anyway, he, he goes on and on. I read the one about the 10,000 hours. Is that the same yeah. one? Yeah. <laughs> and it, he goes on and on about, you know, people, big people who've made it, like, and mm -hmm. this, I, I think I'm the, my family, I'm the group that didn't make it into outliers, right? That should be in there. <laughs> um, because there wasn't any jazz, there wasn't any trips to the museum. My parents were just trying to make it. Um, just no, live and no, day by day. There's no, no music, no art, no, no, but there church, wasn't any culture. <laughs> okay. Well, you there's know? some, there's some culture in church. Well, even the I guess net, it depends I, on your church. No, no, hold hold on to your hat. <laughs> okay, there, Eric, yes, ma'am. Because um, my parents once they were non-traditionalists. They didn't believe in like the Baptist traditional black church. So they kind of like I I was born like most of us. We came out of Mainline Philadelphia, hmm. and we went to kind of what they called a hippie church at one point. We had a <laughs> um, we had a, a woman was our pastor. Oh. And it was come as you are. We had like food drives and clothes giveaways. And it was just really homey like that. <laughs> so it was hippie church. It, I guess now you could really say it was hippie church. My parents didn't think I love it was that. hippie church. Oh, okay. um, it was non-denominational. That's the word. And they always went to non-denominational churches, even when we moved to out to the country in Virginia. So there's that. So I wouldn't say even g traditional gospel music wasn't really around in the house. Right, right. So it was really just the family and my parents working hard. So then fast forward, because we could be here all night. Um, <laughs> I go to college and I had no idea what I wanted to do. I felt um, I was just average inside. I felt it was this average black girl. Nobody told me I was good at anything. I didn't know what I was good at. And um, I took a, my um, advisor said, you need an art selective. Mm -hmm. So let's take a, let's sign you up for a theater for non-performance majors. And so that's how it all started. Rhonda Kaiser, shouting you out, sister. <laughs> she was the grad MFA student who mm -hmm. taught the course. And I had to go over to the Performing Arts Building at VCU in Richmond, Virginia, to take this class, I went down, I called it the dungeon. I had to go down in the basement. I was like, who 
like they have classes down here in the basement, <laughs> you know, all these studios and stuff like that. And all of us students were in here from all these different majors. I was a mass comm major at the time that was safe, right? You become mass comm major mm -hmm. in the PR track. That's where I thought I was like heading. And then um, halfway through the course, we had our one-on-ones and Rhonda looked at me and she said, so I see your major is mass communications. Are you happy with that? And I was like, huh? <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, are you passionate, excited about it? And I was like, uh, I guess so. And she said, well, have you thought about acting? And I was like, no, I thought it was a joke. No, <laughs> that was, she's like, well, I think you should pursue it. You have a natural knack for it. You should, you should do it and you should change your major. Whoa. And I tell you, and I, to your listeners out there, I'm telling you, no one ever told me that I was good at anything. Hmm. So I didn't, I was thrilled. And I also was, didn't quite believe her. I was like, why is this white girl telling me I'm like good at something? No one else told me. And then she said, I want you to go and think about it. And I will help you go through the process of auditioning and what you need to know to change your major. Wow. And all it took for me, I tell you, in my dorm room one night to think about it. That's all I thought about. I was like, I'm doing it. Wow. Doing it. Cause that's all I needed to hear. I was good at something. Yeah. What year was this in college? Um, oof. really, Eric? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Never mind. Let's move <laughs> to the next question. It doesn't matter. Freshman, Manhattan, sophomore, theater, junior. Yeah. Oh, I was, yeah. I was. I was halfway. I was. Okay. Um, I was my sophomore. So I had a lag year. I had an additional year in undergrad because I did change my major. I had to audition for the School of the Arts, and I got mm -hmm. in. That's and awesome. the chair sat me down in, in his office one-on-one, -on -one, right? And scared the bejesus out of me. He said, I don't know why you want to do this. You know, he, he, he's like, you're accepted into the program. But let me tell you the statistics. <gasps> I kid you not. <laughs> and, well, then after, and then after he gave his spiel, and then he said, so do you still want to uh, change your major? <laughs> I said, yes. <laughs> True story. You know, speaking of um, family, as we were talking about it, and I, and I want to get to this. I read, I've done a deep dive into Mary E. Hodges this week. Uh oh. Um, yeah, no, not uh oh. <laughs> I, I've I've found some really incredible things on you, and some articles that you've written, and interviews that you've done, and um, you and I talked a little bit about family, and you have a son. Yes. He's nine. Ten. Ten. Just turned ten. Going no. on twenty. Going on 20, 10 going on 20. But you did an interview with Emily Mann oh, um, yeah. talking about family. And uh, I want to turn the tables on you about it because okay. you asked her this question. I'd like to ask it to you. Okay. Um, oh, oh, I don't remember um, what I asked No, well, yeah. well, that's good. So I'm going to ask it to you. That's, that's good. Yes. I love her. Um, Emily, Hi, they, Emily. I hope you're watching. I hope you're listening too. Okay. So Emily said you quoted her. Being a mother definitely made me a better artist. No question about it. You understand the human race by having a child and feeling that much love. It's just astounding. It affects my writing, my mentoring, my giving to the education department in my raising money, all of it. Being a mother artist, reflecting on where you are now, what comes to your mind? Now you asked this of Emily and mm -hmm. I would love to ask it of you. Mm -hmm. Um. Well, it, it is exactly what she said. It's it's also part of like what before I even had my son, right? The, that whole sense of who you are is just when you have another being that you're responsible for. It's just, you know, our industry is one of like many times of hiding many things about yourself. I'm bringing it back to self. Yeah. And what it sometimes people hide things about themselves for the sake of whatever, getting ahead, success, career. And it's just not normal. Um, and so for me, I can only speak for myself. And at the time, Emily, we had that in common. We were both single parents. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm still a single parent. <laughs> um, and no one to... Uh, help me raise my son. Mm -hmm. 
pretty much. So then the thing is like, so if I want to do this, he needs to come with me sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to bring him. I'm going to bring my bag of Omri goodies and I'm going to create a corner. And, you know, because he's a he was like in the womb going to shows. Mm -hmm. I was doing a show at EST in my like first trimester with Carmen de Lavalade. Mm. Um, on a working on a, a Ruby D one act play called mm. Stepmother mm -hmm. that was directed by the late Chuck um, Chuck 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 Patterson. Uh huh. And so I'm just always been determined of like, okay, that's not going to stop me. I shouldn't be. I've been discriminated for everything under the sun, and here I am having a child. I'm not going to be discriminated for having a child too. So I kind of, Eric, just demanded that I'm going to do it. I love it. Hell or high water with my son. And if that means that I'm bringing him, I'm bringing him. And, and change the people in the room with you. Right. I, can, can, I'm sorry, John. Can you just repeat that last part that you said about the other people in the room? Yeah, it's changing the culture of the people in the room with you. And the mindset of how people, you know, used to, and some people still think. Yeah. Um, I, one of the most That's astounding so things um, ever, I worked with Kwame at um, Baltimore Center Stage. We we're doing this bit, and there were like a couple women who had kids, and um, they would bring them sometimes, and he would literally hold the child and direct or like uh. have them be in the room. And, and like, I asked him about it one day, and he said, it's theirs. Let them have, like, it's going to be theirs. So let them own it from now. Yes. And I just thought that was such a beautiful way to hold, to hold that. Um, I have, I, I have a question because not only are you a mother, you're, a, you're, you're a mother to a black child. Right. And so in this, in this time, in this world that we're living in, like, talk about the conversations, like the, 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 the tension maybe of having to have conversations to keep them safe, but also to let them be free and be themselves. Right. Um, well, that's the thing, because my son's very free and now I feel like I'm paying for it. <laughs> 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 you know, usually, you know, he's at least gone through, if I'm online in rehearsals, he's, he's gonna pass through at least once people might meet him once because he's going to want to know. And I allow him to see what I'm doing. So I'll let him come in and see. I was like, oh, Omri wants to say hi. This is Omri. And everyone <laughs> will wait. And he'll wait. He'll do one of these and he'll disappear. And it's like, um, again, it's one of those on the flip side of something I've never hidden from him because it's part of who I am. And it's like, and in and, and raising him, John, I deliberately um, was very progressive because hmm. I knew I was a theater artist and I was an artist and that I would have jobs that would um, uh, hold my attention, demand my attention. And I needed my child to be independent. Um, and so, um, you know, we did a lot of things. And as a matter of fact, back to having a child in New York City, that's the first time that I started really going to all the museums when mm. I had Omri. I had the baby carrier and we would just go. <laughs> We'd go to all the museums because you know what? You could get this culture thing and you could go for free with your kid. And like, so I just like started going to the museums and we go to the, all this artist stuff. He went to plays and he would sit in the back, you know, with me and the carrier. And he would hear, he went to a lot of Shakespeare stuff, John Andrew. Hmm. He was a Shakespeare baby first, <laughs> you know, when I was doing all this Shakespeare and he would hear all these words and these sounds. And then as he would get older, like five sitting in the back in the rafters there and he would hear language. I was like, we're going to hear some language. I was like, don't you repeat it. Okay? Don't you repeat it. <laughs> Even hear some bad words. And to this day, you know, he knows that. So I just, um, Welcomed it, welcomed it because again, like I said, my household growing up, there wasn't any. So I really wanted to 
do the yeah. opposite with him. I want to remind our audience um, to ask questions. You can type in your, your questions and uh, they will get um, put to me and John Andrew and we will ask um, Mary the question. Um, Mary, I'd love to, um, time is going so quickly. I, I would love to talk a little bit about slave play and how you got involved with it and um, the impact that that show had on so many people, um, including myself and everybody who saw it. And um, love to hear your point of view, how, how you got that job and the lasting effect the show had on you. Yeah. Um, well, my history begins um, back with New York Theater Workshop. Um, I applied for um, the SDCF observership. Hmm. So it will go back to that. And that whole observership is for um, directors who need exposure with um, uh, and mentoring to off uh, off Broadway and Broadway um, venues. Um, and so I applied and they take like a hundred something plus nationally for the observership. And um, once I went to the ori I went to the orientation and that's when they drop the bomb on you that you're not automatically paired with hmm. a venue. You have to compete for it amongst your peers. So they would post um, shows that would, you know, that are um, coming up that had a participating mentor, meaning the director had to participate with the program not the venue. So if um, shop that is providing the mentorship, Robert is, it comes with him. And then he would say, by the way, I'm a uh, mentee for this program. I may have an observer come in on this show. So that's a little bit of how it works. So um, um, ironically, I did apply for um, Emily Mann's uh, piece that she wrote about Gloria Steinem. And uh, uh, what happens is you have to submit your resume to the foundation and they act like as the middle person and they send the resumes to the director and the director narrows it down and then you're invited to an interview. Hmm. And so I interviewed for that show and I didn't get it. And then you're kind of like sitting and you're waiting, right? You're waiting for things to post and there's stuff all over the country. And I'm like, uh, oh, no, nope, I'm not going to Texas. I'm not doing a musical. Nope, not interested. And it's also for choreographers. So you see the listings and if you see something that you think you want to be involved with, um, you apply. Um, and so then I saw that slave play came up um, and mind you, I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> um, I knew I saw that it was a black director and a black playwright. And I was like, oh, New York Theater Workshop's hot. They don't so much smoking new work. Uh, like, and most of my directing work is new work. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna apply for this. And it was in the fall. It was important for me to try to get something in the fall slot. I was determined and not in the winter and the later slot. Mm -hmm. So I apply, I send in my um, resume and I got a, a notice that said, oh, you, Robert, like to uh, have a conversation with you, interview with you. And then I was like, oh, not his assistant because a lot of the assistants to the directors do the interviewing. And so I think Robert was in LA and I don't know what he was working on at the time. And um, we have a phone call. And, and then I had to do some research um, about slave play, but it hadn't had a premiere. Hmm. It was at um, Eugene O'Neill and at Yale. And then, um, so, and then Robert told me what he was looking for, basically. He said, it's important to me on this play that we have brown people in the room, more hmm. specifically brown women, a black woman. I want a black woman in the room because of the nature of the piece. Hmm. 
And, um, and I really like respected that, that he was transparent with that. Um, and we had a really lovely conversation. And also, cause I'm from Virginia, Jeremy's from Virginia. Um, and so that was that. And then I think uh, a few weeks later, I heard it got the post. So then that's for the New York Theater Workshop. It's not an assistant a director, it's an observership. So mm -hmm. basically you're brought in to observe the process. But Robert said on day one, I'm gonna put you to work. <laughs> and uh, he's like, so, you know, observe, no, I'm gonna have you in it and hands on. And um, the New York Theater Workshop, that staff is like so unique. Um, they create a really family environment there. Um, and it was also Eric and John, my first time being in the room and seeing the pipeline at work. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. That whole thing of like, that's very yeah. real where, you know. <laughs> it's going, it's going somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yes, the pipeline, like, you know, because I don't come from anybody's pipeline, you know, just, right. you know, my mom and dad, that's my pipeline. No, in my own grit, in my own work, you know, not saying people don't work hard or whatever have you. For no, it, I hear what you're saying. There is something to reputations and programs sure. and MFA programs, and I have all that stuff too, you know. Um, it's just not from the ivory tower. And um, it's just interesting, like, once you're in the room, to, to just see it at play. And if anybody says that it's not real, then they're lying. <laughs> <laughs> so then from there, um, that went up and that was amazing experience. Um, I, oh, when I first read the play also, I have to share it with wait. Hi, Jeremy, if you're watching and Robert. So I'm reading this play and the first act and I'm like, um, what? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the prickly hairs. I don't know how I'm feeling about this as a black woman from Virginia. Mm. I don't know. And then <laughs> I read act two and I'm like, oh, he got me. You know, I like to think that, you know, you can like get ahead of a play. And I was like, totally didn't see it coming. He totally deconstructed it and broke it down. And I was like, oh, that's genius. I love it. Um, and then we get into the act three, which is, very far more complex, but also being from Virginia, I didn't do all those um, plantation trips, but I've been to Jamestown like far too many times in elementary school. You go to Jamestown every single year, <laughs> you know, and you they give you a map and you like identify like the landmarks and stuff. But I don't recall ever learning about slavery in the slave quarter. Well, Colonial Williamsburg. If you go to Colonial Williamsburg and they maybe do those reenactments, you might learn about a slave, but. Anyway, <laughs> so that whole Kanisha thing, like I don't relate to her, but I understood everything that she was saying because I think it's just a unique experience being in Virginia. Yeah. Mm. Um, so that's just my take on it. So anyway, that's another conversation, topic of conversation to have about Kanisha and slave play and so on and so forth. But um, I, I really thought, I understood I understood what Jeremy was coming from and I think that's just also kind of just being unique to the place of Virginia and being from the country because he's Martinsville is the country where he's from mm -hmm. there's nothing but flat land there um, and then from there you know it closed it was successful and then um, somebody said called me up and said Mary did you know slave plays go on the Broadway I was like, oh, it is? And then I, you know, you Google and you look and you find. I was like, oh. And then she was like, well, aren't you going to get in touch with Robert? And I was like, um, I don't know. Should I? <laughs> yeah, you should. And she was like, and she's like, if you don't, I'm going to apply for it. I was like, wow, she was being real. And so <laughs> I said, okay, this is Broadway. I don't know. Should I? You know, I questioned and then I was like, well, Go for it. Go ahead. This is what you want. You need this kind of experience. Right. You know? And so I did, and he was very receptive. 
And then I think a couple of days later, as a matter of fact, I was in Virginia when this was happening. A few days later, after I expressed interest, he said, oh, you uh, would like to you know, hire you, bring you on as an AD. There's gonna be another AD. And this all goes to the producers and this is the money. Just so you know, this is the money. There's no negotiating room. It's not very much, but you know, <laughs> would love to have you. And so the rest is history. So that's how I came to be involved with the show. What was the, go ahead, John. Well, I'm so curious about, you know, you're, you're, you're working on a very provocative play. Um, and, you know, I'm so interested in the moments of crafting some of those provocative moments in the room. And then the moment of like the first preview audience, like, <laughs> you know, like knowing this thing's about to happen. We're about to drop a bomb, like, and just waiting yeah. for that. So can you like, yeah. can you talk about like uh, some of the experience of, of, of how some of that very provocative material was handled in the room and yeah. what some of the first audiences their response yeah. to it was and, and how then the tailoring process went after that. Yeah, um, well, I think everybody knew, people weren't naive, knew that we were gonna be dropping bombs <laughs> um, and that people Slave were going play, to be right? um, shocked and appalled um, all at the same time and that folks would walk out, you know, we, you know, um, but, Robert was very clear from day one uh, as far as the space was safe. Um, so once you walk in for work, because it was very clear about the space. So if you weren't working, you didn't need to be in the space because delicate work, things were being crafted. Hmm. So there was very you know specific call times for certain people and certain scene work. And it would be indicated on the call sheet that it was a closed room. We would mm. often have closed rooms. Even for me, like if we had stepped out to go run an errand or get lunch, and if they were working on particular sections, we would text the stage manager, production stage manager, or the other AD and said, I'm outside of the room. So then when it was clear, the person was let into the room. Hmm. So the space, Peter Brook talks about the sacred space, right? Yeah. In the in the empty space, yeah, yeah. is that the name of the book? Yeah. Correct. So the space in that in that regards was very um, sacred and safe. Um, and I think a lot of people assumed when they did see the show that because it was so provocative, that there was no way that the actors were safe. Hmm. How could they? You know, they're risking, they're hurting themselves, they're putting themselves in jeopardy by. Tackling, tackling such provocative material, right? And and, and I, I took offense to that, um, to that in many ways because one, it says, wait a minute, we're theater professionals first and foremost. We're theater. Pro we know we don't jump into anything naive, um, for the most part. I mean, it's a different day. Maybe way, way back in the day, people were actually partially almost having sex, mostly in film and TV because they didn't have intimacy directors, right? Mm -hmm. You're hearing mm -hmm. those horror mm -hmm. stories and stuff come out where people were not safe and that there was actually tongue involved in, in kissing and all of that kind of thing and groping. But we had a safe space. We had intimacy coordinator. It's, it's on the playbill. So I, I, and I'm glad you're you're having me on because we don't hear from assistant directors. <laughs> Have more assistant directors. I mean, I'm not assistant director forever, but mm -hmm. on that show, um, to hear about our experiences because you know we're there to serve the director, and we're quiet. We're behind the scenes. I'm there to help Robert. I'm not the assistant script writer. I'm there there for Jeremy. I'm not there for this person, that person. That's gonna happen automatically. But first and foremost, I assist the director and what he needs. So these are just from my observations from working on it is the safe space and, and knowing when to close 
the room so people can focus on that um, piece of that section of the play that needed to be um, handled with care and the crafting of it. Because mm -hmm. everybody mm -hmm. didn't need to be there. Mm -hmm. Even when we moved into, once we got into tech also, that environment trans, um, Robert brought that also into the theater of space of making sure that curtains, you know how theaters can be really free, that the drapes were closed in the back, um, that people weren't necessarily coming in and out, mm -hmm. um, that didn't need to be in the space. Yeah. Um, and, and having the intimacy um, coordinator there from day one, and also the uh, choreographer, all of those elements, um, and letting people do what they do best, like in their lanes. But it starts with the director and the director created the space, safe space first. And there were many conversations too about, you know, um, when you're really focusing on just having two actors, cause you know, it's the pair, the pair mm -hmm. of the couples. Mm -hmm. So we would focus on this couple and and have conversations like, okay, so what is it? And it, And you would have to just, get raw and deal with the material and have a discussion. And then from there talking and then getting up on your feet and doing it and saying, okay, let's figure out how this works. And then you have the, int and then when it comes to Robert would say, okay, Claire, and he would pass, you know, it was like passing the baton. Yeah, because yeah. Now, now I need the intimacy director to come in to show y'all how to do that. Right. Right. right? Right. Safely. So I hope I answered so, your question. Yes, I have a question from the audience, um, Mary, uh, from Al Michelle. How did slave play affect you emotionally, if at all? It's a two parter. Okay. Uh, did you have any personal uncomfortable conversations with people outside of the theater, with mm. friends or family members about the content? Okay, so I'm going to go backwards with your question. Um, I didn't feel uncomfortable at all. It's other people feeling, <laughs> right. <laughs> expressing, uh, and I, and, and I'm not one to let people put their transpose what they're feeling onto me. Cause that happens a lot. Um, if anything, um, it's what I'm expressing now, a little bit of, um, I was a little taken aback by some people's, um, uh, assumptions of, of what they think happened or didn't happen in the room. That black actors, this whole presumption that black actors were putting themselves at risk and hurting themselves. Like, we're, they're professionals. And, and to me, that looks down of like, um, really the whole team. Because we don't think twice when we see a movie and we see people um, in the storyline um, doing certain sexual acts or what have you, um, provocative things that we see all the time in front of us in television and film. But yet when we, and this is another topic, Eric, about risk taking in the theater, it's like, you know, we pass a lot of judgment. I remember when I saw Blasted, Sarah Kane at Soho Rep, oh my God, I was literally blasted when I saw that show. And and I felt like trapped, I couldn't go anywhere. It kept getting worse and worse in the storyline. I was like, I oh my it. God, it can't get any worse. And then it got worse. I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening in front of my eyes. And then when the show was over, this is really answering your question. Um, I had to check myself. I was really bothered by a lot of what I saw, but it wasn't because it was bad theater mm. and this, hear me. It wasn't because the content in the, it was bad theater. It was done very well. There was a whole explosion and the hotel room was torn apart when the lights came up. I was like, oh, how'd they do that? <laughs> and that space is teeny, yeah. how'd they do that? It was a beautiful hotel room, sweet. And then it was totally in debris. And I was blasted in many ways. And I see why she named it blasted. And then when it was over, I was almost angry. I was like angry, like at what I like I what I saw. I felt manipulated. But then later on, after I cooled down, 
and you're alone with yourself, don't start thinking about it. And I was like, man, how many movies have I seen, including Die Hard, right? That we accept it. And it's just the impact of it live, which is why it's live theater. And mm. I think why Slave Play had such a visceral mm. reaction. Cause you're right, right there. So I think when you, it's something when you let it hit you and then you go away and you let it simmer and permeate, which leads me to my emotional state. I don't know about that question. I didn't have nightmares or anything from working on this play in the rehearsal hall and watching the play. Um, I did recall some things of um, my own dating life and choices hmm. that I hadn't thought about. I bet. Again, yeah. again, I didn't relate to Kanisha specifically. Her her thing was very specific. But I do, I do get the um, the whole exoticism um, of one race um, and how that's the attraction versus um, something on a deeper level. Hmm. Um, but um, my emotional state is fine, and I'm fine. I didn't need <laughs> therapy. So I'm sorry, not to be fishies, but uh, just being real and answering your question. Oh, no, 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 it's good. You know, um, uh, my friend Adam, uh, hi Adam, if you're listening, he, he's, we, we each get tickets for the show and then we'll go to see the show. And he's like, oh, well, lucky us, we got front row for Slave Play. <laughs> you talk about blasted, um, <laughs> sitting in the front row of seeing Slave Play and not, no, I, I, and I don't want to hear anybody talk about anything before I go to see it. But you know, I had to, I had to sit there for a minute. I, I, I was blasted. It, it, it hit me. And when I, when I stopped to think about that show and and how it impacted me and what I think of it, I, I, it's one of those moments in theater that 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 stays with you um, here for always and and up here to 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 think about. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll never forget it as long as I live. And I, and I hope it, it still has a life and it keeps going. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where, and Jeremy, I felt was very clear, right? It, you know, it's not for everyone. And it was interesting hmm. for me watching folks come in and transpose on what they wanted to see. They wanted to see something for themselves. If it wasn't for them, they still wanted to see something for themselves. <laughs> and it was yeah. anger because I People think they wanted, too, right? they, they wanted it to be something else. Yeah. And that's not what you go write a play. You go write something. But this is what Jeremy wrote. This is his story. I know people I hear about people walking out of the play. You know what? There weren't people walking out in nope. the groves. Um, I think it was more um, at near theater workshop is a more intimate space. Hmm. And um, also there were adjustments to like, the ending. Um, a lot of people felt that um, consent was um, wasn't clear, and that bothered a lot of people. And and because it was a black woman and a white male, um, so there was some people were really triggered by that. Um, so, and I am not gonna speak for other people and say they're wrong to feel that way. People are gonna feel what they wanna feel. Of course. But what you, what I feel the dangerous part is it is that, oh, it shouldn't be done. Oh, you need to shut down. Hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I like what you said <laughs> that this was Jeremy's play. You know, you don't like it, then you go write something. I mean, this was his point of view. This was what he wrote. Right. And he's got every right to his point of view. and and what he feels and how he feels it. I, I, that you couldn't have said more perfect. So thank yeah. you. Go ahead, John. I know. I, go ahead. Oh Talk no, I was, I was, I was deep into the listening of the, of the, of the. Um, um, well, okay. So shall we switch gears a little? <laughs> <laughs> go on. Um, I'm, 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 I'm curious. You know, so. Yeah, talk to me a little bit about what kind of what is the what is the theater that that inspires you? Like what what 
you know, give me your like your top five. Like you mentioned, blasted, right? So is it is it is that what you want to experience? What is what is what is Mary E. Hodges wanting to experience? What's the thing that she wants to experience mm -hmm. when she goes to the theater? And then what is the biggest quibble? Like, so it's a two-parter, you know. Ooh, I mean? Okay. <laughs> um, well, yeah, something that's gonna like, I mean, I didn't go there to ask to be blasted. I was like fairly <laughs> ignorant. I had no idea what I was gonna be in for, right? Where some people are like voyeurs, like they look for it. Right. Yeah. They know everything about it and they're looking for it. And those kind of people did come out to slave play. Hmm. You know, the boy, the, you know, I, I have to be careful what I say, but those people came. Uh, but you can't control what people are going to do once you put something out in the world. You can't control it. That's right. You're responsible for the creative hmm. license of what you do and how people experiences is out of your control somewhat. Right. Of course, there's a bit of manipulation as artists. To say that we don't manipulate is like, duh. <laughs> That's what we do at our best. When you're like in a song, John Andrew, you know, if you do it in this certain kind of way, it's going to have a reaction. Mm -hmm. That's manipulation. So don't come at me with that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> what gets me, I always go back to the story of when I saw two trains running hmm. at Baltimore Center Stage X amount of years ago. Uh -huh. <laughs> Marion McClinton directed it. So you can get your Google fingers going and you can find it. I was uh, an actor then, I was still a young actor and I was with this theater company and it was just like a field trip. And we went to go see this production. There weren't big names in it. And, you know, they're getting to like the climax of the play, you know, they're in the diner, you know, and they're towards like the front and uh, somebody gets stabbed or shot in that play, right? And there's blood and there's people crying and there's all this stuff going on. And Hambone comes all the way upstage. It was like the glass wall of the diner. He comes far upstage and starts walking across in a white suit and a hat. And he walked slow motion and then he stopped in the middle, turned, looked at the action, smiled, did his hat and put it back on, turned and walked across. I was through. I was done. <laughs> I People, the blackout, everybody stood up, standing mm -hmm. ovation. Mm -hmm. I couldn't move, y'all. I was stuck to my seat and I just wept. Hmm. And that's what I'm keep what I'm going after. John yeah. Andrew. I'll yeah, never yeah. forget it ever. And may Mary McClendon rest in peace. I never got, I never met him, never got to, to work with him. But that imagery and what he crafted with the whole ensemble of what was happening in the front mm -hmm. of us, and then just bringing that character back in a freaking white suit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because he dies in the play. Yeah. Tragically, and then he just smiled and he just kept, I was just bawling. I couldn't move, I really couldn't. And I had to go read the play. And I'm like looking, flipping through the play. I was like, where is it? I don't see that. Uh, it wasn't scripted. Yeah. That's the director, yeah. creative license. I had to have a discussion with somebody not too long ago. <laughs> um, but, you know, who thinks that a director is supposed to do exactly what the script says, unless it's a new work, an original work, you know, then that's different. But a published play, bringing some, something like that, that's what I, I, I go after kind of every time when I'm directing, like that's, it has to charge me, excite me, move me, move you. I mean, well, I, think, I believe, yeah. I'm sorry, I, 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 unfortunately, we have to start wrapping it up, yeah. Mary, because we talk, but I, I believe that that is uh, why you are here. And that's why you have so many people that believe in what you do. Um, and I can speak for John Andrew on this and say that we're both very big fans. 
And uh, I have a comment from uh, Ken Weiler in the audience. It says, I love Mary E. Hodges. It's not a question, <laughs> it's just a statement. Um, but Mary, um, that's our show. Um, okay. I really want to thank you so much uh, to the wonderful Mary E. Hodges for being our guest tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, John Andrew. Thank you. I wish we had so much yeah. more time. I miss uh, running we, we into you help. in the theater district and at audition. I know, at random times. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I would always walk past and go like. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you, John Andrew, for sharing hosting duties with me tonight. Uh, next Monday for the final Monday of Women's History Month, John Andrew and I have our long delayed and much anticipated interview with Philippa Sue. So you won't want to miss that. <laughs> and after that, we will announce our guests for April and May. So stay tuned. We hope you enjoyed our show. Um, if you did, please like the video and subscribe. For news about upcoming guests, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, on Twitter. Uh, we'll see you next Monday at 7 o'clock. Stay, hey, stay, excuse me, stay healthy, stay safe. Um, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you again, Mary E. Hodges. You are an inspiration, and I cannot wait to see what your next thing is that you do because yes. um, it's going to be magic. So thank you so much. Thank you, audience. Um, have a wonderful evening. Again, stay safe. Thank you for coming. Peace. Bye, bye.